Hello and welcome to the very first Talking Loud Saying Nothing video podcast. Uh, this is Colette. Hello. And I'm Michael. And uh, we're going to be talking about the documentaries, or well, a few of the documentaries that screened as part of the Sydney Film Festival, uh, which we were lucky enough to see yeah. quite a few of. Not all of them. I think they made up like half the program almost. Yeah. It was a lot of docos. There was. And there were some really good ones, so... Excellent ones. In fact, I would say that probably um, one for me particularly was almost my favourite thing of the festival yeah. that I saw. Wow. Yeah. But uh, we, we both managed to see Despite the Gods, yes. uh, which is an Aussie doco by director Penny Wozniak about Jennifer Lynch, the daughter of David Lynch, directing a, um, what would you call it, like a Bollywood horror film? Yeah. Uh, called Hiss. Um, which was like a, I don't know if it was a Hollywood co-production, but, uh, you know, it basically charts her trying to make this film under ridiculous circumstances. On location in India. And just, uh. yeah, anything <laughs> it could go wrong. It's a real eye-opener. And mm. they, they have a, quite a few of those references of, um, you know, uh, there's one bit where one of the crew says, oh... An Indian minute is three minutes. Yeah. He's like, no, an Indian minute is 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. um, and just the difficulties, like culture clash, uh, mm. the whole thing of being a female in that mm. environment as well. Yeah. Um, and being a single mum yeah. as well. Yeah, trying to, well, with the, her child on location with them. And Who, uh, the kid was amazing, you got to say. Like, she <laughs> did so well. The kid is like an, an adult. There's one moment very early on in the film where Jennifer Lynch is just stressing out and her daughter <laughs> just comes up and goes, it's not what you look like, it's in here that yeah. makes the film. Yeah. And you're just like, how old is this kid? Yeah. Turns out she's what? 13? Something, something like that, yeah. Yeah, she's like, incredible. I think it's like the whole LA thing, though. Yeah. I imagine that you grow up, and especially in a film family, probably, oh, absolutely. that you grow up yeah. sooner than you would normally. Yeah, and, and she'd be so used to that scene. So it, it wouldn't even be, to us, it's a little bit more unusual, I guess. But that's all she would have known from, you know, her granddad, I suppose, yeah, and yeah. from her mum. So it's... We're... Can you imagine having David Lynch as your granddad? How crazy would that be? It would be so surreal. <laughs> Come on, granddad, like... can I see your home movies? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, maybe when you're older. <laughs> but I actually, I, I love this doco. I mm. think I think anyone who's a filmmaker, it's hard enough to make a film yeah. under any circumstances, yeah. but seeing it in that context in India and <laughs> just uh, unbelievable. Um, it was actually funny when I went to the screening of it as well they had uh, technical difficulties beforehand and um, when the um, filmmaker went up uh, to you know do their little spiel before she said uh, it's quite appropriate that we would have technical difficulties at the start of this one because it was what the whole thing was like. Well, if anything, I guess it would develop your sense of humour. And I think for, for Penny, who shot it, uh, so she directed it, she shot it herself. She was originally brought on as the babysitter oh, right. for Sydney, and that's why yeah. she was living with Jennifer and had okay. all this access. Yeah. But it's actually like, it's handheld, but it's very steady. It There's is. There's some beautiful shots in it. It's actually a, a really well-made mm. made film and a really enjoyable doco. I was actually a little disappointed in... A few bits of it, though. Um, I, I you sort of mentioned about how uh, it does go into a little bit of uh, the gender difficulties, I suppose. You know, being a woman, a filmmaker in India, um, making a film, but I don't. I don't think it went into it with much depth. I, I kind of wanted more. There was a little bit from the lead female actress, who she was really interesting too. I wish you're right. Actually, I wish that I have heard more from her about because there was a little bit about her experience, also of being a celebrity, her being followed around a lot, but also her the expectations on her. But um, I don't know. Just as a female I've, I've... in in India in the industry, I, I wanted to actually get more out of that. But I didn't get yeah. a much of a, a feeling of there was a problem there with that. It would have been very interesting because she was also like a bit of a groundbreaker as far as Indian cinema goes. She was the first actress to kiss on screen, yeah. which is a, a huge thing mm. there. Um, but there was that moment where she's wearing this skin tight. <laughs> snake thing this film was released it's called hiss um apparently it was a box office bomb um right. jennifer lynch completely disassociated yeah. herself with it from it um she was brought onto it by a friend who was the producer 
And I would love to know whether they're still friends because yeah. the producer just undermines oh, her every yeah, he turn. Does, he does. There's this bit at the end where they're trying to get the last shot of the film, and he's like, "Right, cut, cut, cut." That's yeah. and she's like, "Well, the DOP just told me it's out of focus." Yeah. And he's like, "Oh, you're just wasting money." And yeah. You're like, oh my god, I thought the producer was supposed to be helping you make the film. Yeah, he does kind of turn towards the end. Like, uh, he must have had other pressures, but he he oh, kind of. Man turns on her a bit and, and it's just and like all right we're done let's go quick his quick. treatment of her daughter on set as well yeah. is just shocking yeah um it really is worth a look it's a fascinating sort of behind mm. the scenes it would have been good to hear more from um the lead actress yeah. she when she's in that suit and she sort of turns to the camera and says you know oh these boys they're desperate like this country these desperate boys mm. um mm. and depraved i think mm. she says it's uh, it's telling, but I would love to know more behind that as well. I think the other thing that um, I, I felt was a little missing with the film was um, an ending. I know you can't really end a film like that. It, it, it is quite difficult, but it was just like, and then four years later, this is it. Kind of, the, there was not, I didn't feel like there was an ending to her filmmaking process mm. in India and then but it just sort of skips and then four years is a long time that's true I guess one of the things maybe it was focusing on was the fact that um, you know she's happy and she's with yeah. um, this guy that she yeah. met during the filming process and is still with him yeah that was um, sweet they were gorgeous together <laughs> now a great companion piece to this doco is the world before her um, okay. which does tackle female roles right. in India really well, it actually juxtaposes or shows a beauty pageant being held oh, and okay. um, a woman who's in a Hindu extremist training camp. Wow. And I think it's the okay. first time cameras have ever been allowed into one of these camps. Yeah. Um, and it's, the, it's so complex mm. and so conflicted, the different messages. The one who's in the camp is someone who, of her own, like, you know, she admits freely that she doesn't want to be married at 20 and have babies and fulfill that role mm. and that she loves her role in the camp as a, an older person training others and they're training them to use you know slug guns but they're training them with guns and they're training them to fight yep. um, and that she you know talks about how she wants her own independence and wants to do things differently but it's the whole it's so complex because she's still training people to be exactly what she doesn't want to be. Mm, and then, yeah. you know, he's stories of her father disciplining her and her accepting that, you know, he he burns her with a hot poker when she's a child to teach her a lesson. Like, okay. it's full on. Yeah. And then that's against this um, beauty contestant whose family is so supporting. So it's sort of like New India and Old India. So is the link just that it's this is two aspects of india like the the, the umbrella is india and here's one section here's the other or is there some it other is, link between these because they're the, very disparate the girls don't know each other but it's a very skillfully cut doco okay. and it does it really well um and it sort of shows like you know there's a, an older indian lady who's the beauty pageant um not the director but maybe one of the overseers of it mm. or a patron of some sort and she says that, you know, when the girls talk about old India, she I always choose new India. But then you see them in the beauty pageant scenario. And obviously the idea of a beauty pageant to us is not the new world at all. It's mm. 1950s or 60s. Yeah, and, yeah. it's quite you know, dated. And and it's also, you know, generally a sexist sort of. Yeah. It's, and the guy that runs the pageant is a sleazy sexist overweight male. <laughs> um, and he's quite proud as he tells the camera, oh, I came up with... Uh, the idea that they wear um, like a, a shroud over their heads to judge the best legs. So he's got them in bikinis on the beach and they all have to wear like <gasps> giant, you know, Casper the Friendly Ghost uh, sheets on their heads so he's not distracted by their other womanly attributes. He can just focus on their legs. So wow. it's it's just demeaning. And they even have like one of the contestants who's really eloquent mm. in the interviews saying... Mm. You ask yourself, you know, how, why am I doing this? Like, I'm abasing myself. So, well, why it is she way doing it? Because through that, if you win that beauty pageant, oh, by the way, mm. everyone in India watches this beauty pageant. Okay. It's televised. Yeah, yeah. The Hindu um, separatists watch this on TV. <laughs> They're disgusted by it, but they watch it. Yeah, yeah. In the same way that we might watch 
I don't know, voice, Jersey Shore or something, you know, and you hate yourself afterwards. Mm. And, you know, you know you're losing brain cells, but you're mm. just drawn yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, and so for them, it's a way of escape. Mm-hmm. If you win, yeah. it's huge modeling contracts, film and uh, on you go. Yeah. But it still kind of reminds that, me of um, um, Slumdog Millionaire. Right. So it's kind of, a, I guess, a similar thing. Yeah, I said the reality is yeah. so much harsher yeah, and just horrible. I mean, uh, but it's yeah. just the idea of you know uh, an escape is you know something that's it's an borderline Im- demeaning. Or, yeah, you know, it's not really that demeaning to be on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, but you gotta know what I mean. Yeah, and I think that you know the the girl that was eloquent in the interviews, mm. she just stutters when she's asked a question. Oh really? She's asked what she thinks about oh how would she react if her son was gay? Okay. And she knows that she's facing a conservative or yeah. conservative audience, the newer thing. And her answer is very mixed up. And she says she wants to slap him, but she would accept him. It's just, mm. oh, well, it's, it's she, really painful to watch. Yeah, that would But be the docker was fantastic. Yeah. Wow, that does sound amazing. Uh, another one that we were uh, able to see, both of us, um, Maori Boy Genius, a movie made by a New Zealand... Oh, actually, I think the filmmaker is Australian. Oh, but it's right. about a uh, New Zealand... Sort of, it's kind of like Maori a, tribal, but yeah, like a modern tri- tribal. A, look, I I don't know much about that sort of stuff, but mm. um, it seems that this kid is chosen from birth. There were lots of signs that he was a chosen one, and they look to him in his community and his mm. tribe to be a future leader. And his family, at great financial sacrifice, um, you know, sent him to summer school at, at Harvard. Yeah, yeah, as a teenager, because he is a little bit... Well, he's... Here's my take on it. He's a big fish in a small pond, but you put him into a, an ocean, and he's kind of... He very much fades into the background. He's very... He's almost uh, under par. Like, he's he's not quite up to the same standard as... Yeah, but considering his background, and he's his age. outstanding. Yeah, he's really yeah. young. Like he taught himself to speak English at three, I mm. think, um, and was he was too young to do. He was ready to sort of graduate from college in New Zealand mm. Mm, at like fourteen or something like that. Now this is when I watched it. Um, I watched it with um, my partner and his mum, who were both originally from New Zealand. Um, and they were kind of giving me some context behind right. some things. Now, the with the that particular university thing is that uh, a lot of Maori um, schools were getting um, subsidised from the government, um, and it was just by having students in it. So a lot of the students weren't actually graduating; they were just sort of almost pretend students, oh, really? so that they would get the, the government subsidies. So that was why he was to, uh, wasn't allowed to be to graduate right. because he was outside of an age, like so he was too young, and I I think that it was sort of considered that maybe he was, or you know, generally kids of that age would be not exactly rotting, but there was that possibility. Um, right, right. So I'm not saying anything about the school that, that themselves. It's quite highly likely that they're a legitimate school it's just that the the government had changed its rules and i was actually it was really good hearing the maybe white new zealand side right. of the 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 story it was, it was like really interesting getting the maybe a little the more balance between sort of the indigenous yeah, point of view because and... it is very strongly on the indigenous side I think it still displays things as they are. It's actually quite painful watching him realise himself and his dad is, you know, all this money has been sunk into it. Like, their family are in debt to their eyeballs. Um, Even just trying to get him, like, a laptop, you know. um, And then being in the States and at at these uh, summer school sessions and just seeing that he's, like, not coping and you just... Your heart just breaks because... It's not just that he's not coping. It's like the pressure put on him from his family, the weight of expectation well, not, on him his whole life. And not just his um, family, the his, entire community uh, yeah. rely on him. He's the one, he's the leader that's going to take them forward. And it's it's very painful to watch him sort of go home early. There is a ray of hope, though, which comes from mm. the things that he does understand, which is his, his tribal past mm. and their history as people on that land. And that becomes of great interest 
to uh, one of the professors that he has there mm. um, in political science and he works on a piece with him and which you know leads to him getting an amazing grade in that particular yeah. uh, subject but um, so that that um, the, I think I was like oh thank goodness you know he's the things that do make him special mm. are being recognized I have to say um, it probably sounds a bit mean but I didn't really like his sort of character he right from the start he has this um i'm smarter than you attitude i know exactly what you're talking about but i just that's just put in him like the way his yeah, I know, siblings I, are I, made I to that. defer to him as yeah. well you kind of it's like he's a little sort of king yeah but uh, that's why at the end when he gets that uh it's almost validation that all of what he thinks of himself is accurate, but he, I don't, I don't feel like he's a genius. I don't, I don't feel like that. In, maybe in his community, he might be the genius. Yes, but I think at the title Harvard, of the film school, is tongue in cheek. So I'm sure. I wasn't sure. Oh, really? I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. No, no. I think that that's you know a little bit tongue in cheek. I, yeah, I, I really, yeah. It could be. I was hoping maybe, but I, I wasn't sure. Look, I still found it interesting, um, and the end where he leads a sort of political um, mm. protest about, um, you know, the taking of land um, by government, it's on their national day, and you see the contrast of, like, the, um, you know, the New Zealand Navy doing a 21-gun salute and what have you, and mm. then um, the Maori people and their festival on the water, and then they march on the thing, and by the time he gets there, it's just... I'm giving away the ending, aren't I? Sorry. Possibly. Well... Anyway. And then things happen. Yeah. <laughs> or not. But anyway. Mm. So what else did you see? Um, I was actually really lucky enough to see the Woody Allen documentary. I was very keen to see that, but I didn't get a ticket and also couldn't bring myself to get out of bed and be at a cinema at 9.30 in the morning on a Monday. Yeah, it was kind of early, but uh, I soldiered on. Um, yeah, it was really quite good. Um, I, I think it was directed by the guy who's done a lot of episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm, oh, okay. which is really appropriate for a Woody Allen documentary. I mean, absolutely best fit. <laughs> um, and there is a little bit of a feel of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. You know, it's not, obviously, it can't be. Is he naturally funny? Woody Allen? Yeah. Uh, in the interviews, probably not. Um, you see him in sort of maybe more staged interviews like of, of older footage where he is very um, like improvising comedy and right. I think he is a quick mind but Absolutely. I think he uses it when he needs to and right. yeah um, but the interesting thing is with this um, documentary is it's actually um, a theatrical edit of a two part three hour uh, TV documentary, so it is actually supposed to be quite a bit longer. Um, right. So wow. yeah, there were three hours per part. So that's um, wow. That sounds amazingly yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they cut that down to however long it was, a couple of hours. Um, and as a result, unfortunately, it kind of misses a fairly big chunk of his career. And I, I thought quite unfortunately because it misses goes from about the start of the nineties to about twenty ten. Okay. So that's that's a big chunk because I managed to miss Vicky Christie Barcelona because that would be worth missing out I reckon I didn't mind Vicky Christina Barcelona but oh, I, see, I didn't, I, 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 didn't right. I didn't I didn't love it but not a fan of that one um but it, it uh misses you know some of the musicals that he did so that would have been interesting oh, to go yeah. into but it was sort of fascinating um hearing and, and watching how his process is as far as writing um and his directing style Hearing from actors how he sort of so doesn't give, give him feedback, kind right. of. Right. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, 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 I know some actors who auditioned for him in the early 2000s, mm. like maybe 2002, I think, um, and it was for a play that he was directing mm. uh, for the Atlantic Theatre Company. And they said that the audition process, they were briefed beforehand not to look at him or address him directly to just come in and you do the piece and you would talk to an assistant. Mm. And that he sort of sat in the corner of the room, there were lots of other people there with him as well, and he just he didn't even look at him. 
Wow. Um, so I don't know. Obviously, they're not going to show that side of him no. in the doco that he's saying, <laughs> or whether he's really like that. But well, the yeah, the actors, uh, a lot of you know the film actors, quite famous ones, you know, are. Um, <laughs> there was actually a bit where Sean Penn says he's still not sure whether Woody Allen was happy with his performance. In but, Sweet and Low Down. Yeah. He's, he has no idea. Uh, and he's still kind of waiting for, you know, hey, you did a good job or anything. <laughs> so it's kind right. of weird hearing, you know, Sean Penn, who's quite accomplished and... Yeah, yeah. I can't, yeah. You can't imagine him wor- needing validation, but I guess, yeah. you know, you're looking for Woody Allen, that's a pretty big deal. Sure. Um, and yeah, that was kind of also mentioned that uh, maybe a little, uh, some of the younger celebrities... Um, that are maybe a little more celebrity whore kind of wanted the validation and the feedback. You know, did I do that okay? Was that fine? So this is really a doco about him as a filmmaker. They're not dredging up any of the uh, stuff about Mia Farrow and... It is. Do they talk about that They do. And I I don't think you could have a Woody Allen documentary without it, without at least touching it. It's a bit Um, hard, isn't it? To, to avoid it would it would seem like a, a gaping hole in the documentary and in the story or a gigantic of him. elephant in the room but it is actually interesting that it puts it into a better context because you know Woody Allen didn't do a lot of uh, press or you know doesn't really do much at all no um, and so it was kind of interesting you do hear a little bit of his side and obviously from his perspective is not nearly as creepy as it sounds sure still, well you know i could kind of sell me anything i guess but <laughs> it, yeah from the outside it doesn't seem too flashy yeah but it but it is actually really interesting even just looking at that and it, even his relationship with uh diane keaton like how that right. worked and kind of I don't know, I've got a sense that maybe Diane Keaton still had a thing for him. Oh, really? Look, I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this. I might just get the box set and watch the whole version. Absolutely. I would say definitely do that. I I would actually like to track that down because I would like to see the full, have the full experience because Woody Allen was so prolific and an amazing, you know, well, up and down, very... Yeah, yeah, no, but like... When he's up, he's... Way, way up. Absolutely. Yeah. So, was there anything else that you got around to seeing? I got to see Dreams of a Life, which I think would probably ended up being one of my favourite things that I saw. Not favourite documentary, but favourite thing in the festival, Wow, virtually. Okay. Um, This is the one I really wanted to see, too. I was lucky enough to to get a chance to go and see it, and I hadn't thought about... I didn't think about seeing it until someone else was sort of talking about it, having seen it. On paper, I don't really like... uh, recreation documentaries mm-hmm. and mm. that's this had to rely on that a lot but yeah. they did it so well the story is um it's about a woman who was found who died in her flat in london but no one found her for three years mm. after her death when i think a neighbor i mean even when the neighbor complained of the smell on the flat next door no one checked it out it wasn't until she was thousands of pounds in you know hock for rent that the door was broken down and they found her body. Like, what was left of it? Wow. And so um, people were just astonished. Like, mm. how could you, you know, be gone for three years and the family didn't report mm. a missing person? There's no partners. No, no one knew. So the filmmaker, like, ran a series of, um, you know, classifieds essentially saying, did you know Joyce Carroll? Mm. Uh, and people came forward. And so it's interviews with friends and the family... Uh, for obvious reasons, declined to be interviewed. Yeah. Um, because it probably didn't make them look too good. Yeah. But um, and this information is revealed basically just as post-it notes. So I know some people said oh. when they saw the film they didn't know. They're like, why weren't the family? And I was like, oh, didn't you see the post-it note? But you you really have to read. It's not just a pan across information. You you've got to read them to know important bits of info. Okay. Um, but it's interviews with like ex-lovers um, mm. and friends from those groups. And it sort of just reveals this character of this like incredibly beautiful woman who mm. sounded really, you know, like she would people would be just drawn to her. Mm. Um, there's a bit where she goes to a, like a conference with this her partner at the time, and mm. it's you know when Nelson Mandela was in uh, London giving a speech, and mm. you know she meets Mandela, not him, and he's like, I was always crushed that it was her and not me, but she drew people to her. So how can someone go from being this 
person with such life that draws people to you yeah. to dying alone in your flat with no one calling or you know obviously I guess if you're calling the thing is that you discover that she didn't really uh, you know she would cut people off and she was very secretive about parts mm. of her life and I think that the main thing that comes out of this film is that and this is the thing that was great about it, it was like everyone you could just hear the whole cinema afterwards like engaged in that thing and I think you would have like one effect or another on you you would either come out of that going oh my god could that happen to me could mm. I die alone mm. or you're like oh my god I need to go and call yeah long lost friend yeah my mum my dad <laughs> exactly everyone, yeah. um, and it was just so uh, afterwards in the photo I met this woman who was like oh, a, a British lady and she was like oh I uh, we were talking about it and she said oh I, I actually had this on DVD I'd seen it before because I had this friend who I had a falling out with Mm. and uh, it was crazy. And then I emailed him a few years later. We didn't speak again and he never responded. And then eight years later after that, I get an email going, hey, just wanted to see that you're okay. Mm. Um, She was like, oh, I'm actually in London right now. She lives in Sydney now. And uh, they met up and he gave her that DVD. It was the reason that he finally replied to her email. Wow. And so it had that yeah. sort of effect. You could just sort of feel it the way people discussed it. Yeah. I think it really uh, examined how, you know, what modern society is like, that disconnect, the loss of community. Yeah. Um, really, really powerful mm. piece. The, the um, what do you call them, like the recreations were really well handled. Mm. I well, hate watching that stuff yeah. normally. I thought the, um, because I I watched the preview to it, because I was trying to convince my partner to go along to this, but I couldn't quite make it, because I think he looked at the previews and thought the same thing as you did, as like, oh, it's recreations, but I actually thought the story sounded fascinating, and the the recreations looked like you could go along with this as being the story. It's it's actually heartbreaking watching this particular, um, you know, partner who... Obviously, she was the love of his life, mm. um, and things fell cool. apart in that. So mm. it's just, uh, yeah. The weird thing was, the lady sitting next to me had been brought in by her friend mm. um, and not been told um, what she was watching. Okay. And she turned to me afterwards, and she's like, "Wow, there's some bits where I just had to remind myself that I was watching actors." And I was like, "Wow, y- you you weren't." <laughs> yeah, they were. You were oh, yeah, in the yeah. recreations, yep. but the interviews were real people. And she's like, "Oh," and her friend's like, "Oh, I should have told you it's a doco." <laughs> wow, well, that's that's impressive. But I I think that the thing that made the recreations work is they were beautifully shot. It was well laid out. It wasn't gratuitous. They didn't do a dead body on the ground yep. thing because it would have been um, disgusting. Mm. Um, but they still took creative license because you would have to because okay. no one knows what happened yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, it's just... Do they actually come up with theories? <coughs> Excuse me. Do they actually come up with theories? Um, about her death? Yeah. There was... I mean, they recognised her from dental records, matching them to a smile and a photo. Yeah. Um, they don't really know what happened. They knew that she'd run from an abusive relationship, um, but they weren't able to show much more about that. So you do come away wondering those things. Mm. But, but there's think, no... The... <coughs> I'm sorry. Um... I think one of the things that it really highlights is that, like anything you watch in the cinema, a great story is something that gets you talking. Yeah. And this certainly did that. Wow. I'm intrigued. I yeah. must track it down. Yeah, you definitely need to see that one. Cool. Excellent. Well, I think that's about it for our very first video podcast. You'll have to excuse Little Fades to Black in the Middle. We had some trouble <laughs> and most of it was due to coughing, which we haven't bothered to cut out of the last bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, See you next time. Bye.